Welcome to Actions and Limits. My name is Justin Atherton. I'm the Peak Performance Consultant for Confidence Unchained. With me as always is Paul Fortune. Paul is a mindset coach and the founder of A Call to Action. And together, we make Actions and Limits. Welcome to the show, the podcast where we talk about the actions we can take and the limits we create. Uh, make sure, don't miss an episode, subscribe or follow on YouTube or your favorite uh, podcast platform and make sure you're getting all these great interviews uh, that are coming up on the show. Uh, Paul, speaking of interviews, we, we got a great one today, Josh Bashinsky. Um, he's coming on the show and i Man, I'm I'm excited to to pick his brain. I know you and I've been checking out his content. He's got a lot of great information. Um, I'm excited to have him on the show, man. Yeah, we're definitely going to dive into philosophy here. It looks like, and I know that's that's right up your alley, Justin. I think that uh, topics you're going to eat that up with a spoon. So I know that you are excited to ask him some questions, and and we're probably going to go deep. So yeah, we'll yeah. enjoy it. I, I'm excited. He's there's so many different areas that he's involved in, but um. Well, let's go ahead and, and get into it because I know he's going to have a lot of information for us. So, um, Josh Bazinski, so he's a TEDx talker, philosopher, teacher, and expert marketer. Josh has an MA and PhD in neuroscience, psychology, and philosophy. A TEDx talk called The Future of Google Search and Ethics. Uh, Josh has also mastered meditation. Both, both Eastern and Western techniques, and developed a system of meditation called Bach Meditation. Uh, he also has three black belts and has been doing internal Asian-based martial arts for 30 years. And finally, Josh lives in a beautiful city of Victoria, um, BC, Canada, with his darling wife, uh, British Columbia, Canada, right? And he can be contacted for any questions at uh, joshbazinski at gmail.com. Um, yeah, man, let's bring out Josh to the show. I'm really excited to have him. Come on. So everyone, welcome Josh Basinski to the show. Josh, re really glad to have you on the show, man. My pleasure, guys. Nice to be here. So, man, your bio, you touch on so many different areas. You know, you, you talk about meditation, you know, black belts. I personally am really interested in the whole neuroscience and psychology, you know, different aspects of that what would you say is like, is your bread and butter, man? Like what is the main thing that you're putting out there? That's a great question, Justin. Um, you know, I've had a very eclectic life. I've had a lot of, uh, a lot of experiences over my 45 years and uh, I'm a philosopher. Philosophy is my main bread and butter in terms of who I am, but in terms of what I do, I do marketing. That's what pays the bills, right? I do search engine optimization. Okay. Nobody wants to pay me for my philosophical opinions, <laughs> right? Which is, which is usual, right? Socrates back in the day in Athens, before they put him to death for talking too much, literally, hmm. uh, uh, they, they proposed that the Athenian court worked like this. They, after they sentence you, they propose, the, the defendant gets to propose a punishment. And so Socrates, which was always, he had a little bit of a sharp tongue, said, Sure, my punishment should be that you, you house me and pay me to tell you how dumb you are on a regular basis because that's what the polit politics needs is philosophy to keep it straight. So I'm kind of a philosopher in the way Socrates is a philosopher. I tend to say things that people don't like, no matter how true it might be. Uh, so, so no one pays me for my philosophical opinion. There you go. Uh, so I, I, I have to reverse engineer Google's algorithms and uh, sell that information to a mentorship group to, to make my money. So. It's an interesting concept. Who are you? Are you your occupation or are you something else? I, I prefer to, I, I don't equate myself with my occupation because that would be depressing. I, I equate myself with, with who I want to be and who I am, which is a philosopher. And, and that's always like a, an odd topic right there, right? Like the identity. Where does your identity land with that? It's like, so I do this as a job. That's not who I am. This is who I am. I'm just not getting paid to do it yet, you know, but right. I, I like that aspect of what you said about keeping people honest with the philosophy and, and tell them, Hey, here's another point of view. You know, that, that's not a bad thing that, that, that people 
I think nowadays too, uh, it seems like that's something that people really need. It's like, hey, question your beliefs and your values and see if you know they can stand the test of time, whatever those are. So, right. So that that's super interesting to me. I know Paul and I were talking about you know the the SEO and um, that was. Uh, a, a new topic for for Paul. You know, he was super interested in that. So I know I'm sure Paul, you have some questions about that as well. Sure. Well, a lot of that stuff. Uh, I was uh, looking at your comps, and a lot of that stuff, man, it went zooming right over my head. You were you were breaking down the math, and I'm like, oh man, this is this is deep stuff. Yeah. But before we get into that, I, I was interested in the philosophy. When did you get into it? Was that as a kid? Your interest started as a kid, or or when? Yeah. No, that's. That's a good, that's a great question, Paul. That's exactly right. It was when I was a kid. One of my earliest memories, I must have been around four, three or four. I was born and raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, which is kind of a cow town, a farm town, middle Canada, two hours north of the border from, from North Dakota. And uh, we were driving north on the 60 Pamina bus just past the uh, Golden Boy. Everyone in Winnipeg will know exactly what I'm talking about. About to hit downtown, uh, the, the Eaton's uh, and the Bay. Hudson's Bay Company, which was the big store. I think you guys have Macy's. We have we have the Bay. It's kind of the equivalent there. Okay. And uh, I was I couldn't even speak yet, but I could understand language. And I, my grandma was having a discussion with a, another person on the bus and uh, the bus driver. And I realized that the guy on the bus had said a contradiction. He literally said A and not A. And I realized it made no sense. And I realized, oh wow, language can make no sense. And I realized oh, wow, I'm the only person here who noticed that, apparently. Oh, wow, this is how the rest of my life is going to go. I literally realized all those things in that moment. And it's a very clear memory to me, very visceral memory. I can remember the bus and the smell of diesel and, you know, moving around. And, and so that's when I realized I was a philosopher. And that's the difference is that I have a weird brain that, that is, it's not fast, it's slow. I have a slow brain. And I analyze everything somebody says. And my brain goes, wait a minute, <laughs> It didn't make any sense, actually. Let's go back a few steps. Hold on a second. And that's the thing about a philosopher brain is that we don't go fast. We're not, we're not super smart. We're not geniuses. We go slower, actually, and we analyze everything somebody says. And we try to get the texture of it and the meaning of it and all the different branches of where that can go. And that, uh, that, that uh, discovery excites, excites us. We're like a detective on a trail. We're like, oh, clues, clues. You know, we're going, looking everywhere we can to find the the context of all the concepts that we can find out. So that's where it started, Paul, to, to give you the precise moment. And Josh, how old were you when you had that happen? I, I, it was before I could talk and way before kindergarten. Uh, oh, I wow. had to be, but I was already living uh, in another house. So I had to be four at the oldest, five at the oldest. And, and yeah, that's like right at that cusp of like your first memory, right? And, that, and wow, that's yeah. pretty, that's pretty amazing to have that be your first memory. And and the way you're talking about how you're dissecting like what people are saying and slowing it down, I, th there's an idea of, of content analysis that I really enjoy and just breaking mm -hmm. down um, exactly what people are saying. And there's a concept, you, you may find this interesting. Uh, this was brought up to me in, in a, a training I went to. They talked about believe everything that people say because they will tell you the truth that they can. Hmm, yeah. And so it's, it's interesting to, to, people give that truth that they can. It may not right. be fully or they're omi omitting certain things, but that's... Yeah, the pe people get into certain psychological paradigms, certain emotional paradigms, and that's their truth for that moment, right? Yes. When, when um, uh, the, uh, the African-American community in the States has a lovely phrase that I've always loved. It says, you feeling me? I've always loved that phrase because it kind of points to that kind of psychological perspective. Are you feeling my argument? Not only do you agree mm -hmm. conceptually, are you feeling what I'm saying? Right? Are you in the same emotional place? Yeah. And it's those emotional places that allow us to, not to belabor the metaphor, but to reach for other outcroppings to get other places. Uh, whereas traditional philosophy would eschew that kind of a view. We'd be like, no, pure reason, you know, in, in the clouds, you know, <laughs> divorced from all emotions in all contexts, this is the way, you know, and uh, I can see the virtues of both both perspectives because, of course, I also studied the neuro a little bit of the neuroscience, a little bit of psychology in my PhD as well. Uh, which, it was mostly philosophy, mostly ethics, but uh, I, a little bit of uh, neuroscience and psychology as well, which gets more into the meditation that uh, that I do as well. Uh, Josh, uh, talk to me a bit when you were a kid. Obviously, you you probably think uniquely 
against some of the other kids growing up. Uh, did that serve you in a positive light or did you get a lot of negative feedback because of your, your, your different thinking? <laughs> well, what a question. Uh, well, you see the red hair and, and you see the glasses and those glasses started early. So, and I have three black belts now. So you, you guess, <laughs> you just guess how well the, treat, the kids treated me. So no, I was, I was the proverbial redheaded stepchild. You know, I was obviously singled out and bullied quite a bit. Uh, sadly, I was also abused at home, uh, physically, emotionally, a little sexually. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's a sad story. Uh, you know, it's, um, uh, your trauma travels with you through life. And I looked, I, I like to look at it as a kind of a friend, uh, you know, or, or, or a, a begrudging friend, like, oh, you're coming with me on this journey. Okay, here, here we go. You know, uh, oh, we got a job in Halifax. Come on, trauma. Let's, let's drive across Canada, you know. So uh, it, uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah, so it, there's not much I could say about that that doesn't belittle it. You know, I don't want to belittle, but, but no, definitely. And it, 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 it certainly is in part, not, not fully, but in, in part because I am different and I was different. I do look at the world differently. I had trouble, you know, making friends. I wonder sometimes if I'm on the spectrum. I'm not entirely sure if philosophers maybe are partly on the spectrum, but I don't, I don't in, uh, inhabit any of the other symptoms of, of autism, so I, I don't think so. But I, I think there's many more classifications of the human mind and the way people are that we're, we're just scratching the surface now. Like, sure. We just learned of the spectrum, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like in the last whatever few decades, you know, we're still scratching the surface of personality types and ways of intelligence and ways of thinking and ways of being and and so, no, but uh, to, your, to your question there, Paul, definitely I was, I was set out. Uh, my parents didn't understand me. My brother didn't understand me. My brother probably understood me the best, the begrudging way, you know, the way, the way siblings understand each other. Uh, 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 and the kids certainly didn't understand me. Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, that's life, right? There's the sorrow with the happiness. How did you overcome all that? Because look, you have a PhD, you have a successful business. I mean... You started pretty low, and you were able to rise above it. Uh, can you explain what, what steps you took to overcome all this? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I can. So, and it was my love of philosophy. It was my, my desire and my need, my longing to find out why. Because it is that difference that, 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 that fueled me, right? I'm like, why am I different? Why, why do these people treat me this way? What is ethics? What is the ethical way to be treated in the first place? What, what, what is truth? How do I know what ethics is before I discover what truth is so I know that I can verify the, the facts that I'm finding? And so I naturally, all this abuse spurned me to the, the three primary philosophical questions. What is? How do you know what is? So what is the fancy name for that in philosophy is ontology or ontos for Greek being Logia for a rational study of. So ontology is the rational study, uh, rational study of reality or being. Epistemology, how do we know? Uh, how do we verify the ontology? And then the, the value question, what, what is ethics? What is valuable? What is good? What is bad? What is evil? What is right or wrong? Hmm. And so this spurned me onto that path. And uh, uh, it was a long path. It took a long time. I took many detours, some good, some bad. Uh, but I always came back to philosophy and I always realized that that's where I was supposed to be and that's what I was supposed to be studying. Uh, at both Eastern philosophy in terms of the martial arts I studied, I had some very lucky good teachers there uh, who, were, who, who were more right from the philosophical lineage, not like, not like Gaijin or Guaylo watered down, you know, McDojo's handing out black belts. I, luckily, I found some real philosophical practitioners of that back there uh, and, uh, and really good Western philosophy teachers too. And I realized that that is all part of what I now call meditation. And uh, uh, the Western tradition had meditation. It, it dovetails more into prayer, but it's still meditation, right? Like Descartes wrote, uh, Meditation is our first philosophy. It's uh, more of akin to contemplation, co uh, contemplating the concepts, that, that rational pyramid with reason at the top that I mentioned earlier, right? And then will and desire at the bottom. Uh, versus the Eastern concept, which is more fluid, which is more, are you feeling me? Which is more fluid, which is more uh, emotional, but it's more uh, contextual truths, contextual paradigms uh, that they find, uh, um, uh, for lack of a better word, paradigmatic uh, 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 
uh, uh, purchase, where they find uh, uh, their truisms, but they're truisms that can be applied in multiple scenarios that that allow you to maybe get a deeper uh, 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 paradigmatic understanding faster, like the yin yang, for example, or the I Ching. Uh, all situations will alternate to their opposites. Now, taken on the face of it, that statement is a is a rank truism. Yes, of course, all situations will will change. And if they haven't changed yet, well, then they're going to change eventually, right? That, that's right. just saying what Heraclitus says, you never step into the same river twice, right? If you think about no. the water, that river is down there, and now you're stepping into a new river, right? But we still call it the, you know, what, what the Mississippi, we still call it Right? That's the difference between the forms of information, which are static, and they stay the way they are. Two plus two always equals four, no matter how many times you punch me in the face, George Orwell, or you put a rat in a cage and, and torture me, right? You can, you, can, you can torture me until I don't want to admit two plus two equals four, but two, that doesn't stop two plus two from always equal, equaling four. Sure. That's the kind of contemplation that the, the Greeks and the West kind of realized, and like, whoa, you know, geometry and all that. And the East kind of realized more the situational uh, relationships uh, between like yang and yin, between power and receptiveness, between uh, generation and growth, uh, between strength and redirection, and these kind of related concepts. And so I, I studied all these, and I didn't realize I was studying the same thing. And I came by all these different concepts from different places, and I would just sponge just sucking it all up until I realized, wow, I've been studying the same thing the whole time. It's the human condition. It's those three questions. It's, it's all, who are we? What should we do? What's real? What's true? And the, the one bridging concept that was the most important concept that I discovered, and it's in all of these philosophies, but it's probably best expressed by Plato in his book called The Republic. Uh, and it's the concept of the good. The good is the chief concept. The good is the most important concept. The good is the good, the goodest, goodest. The, I, I'll start speaking in like really bad English, but the gooder, the goodest, the, the most ideal, the most idyllic, the most positive, the most joyous, that concept that some later took and uh, uh, moved it into more monotheistic interpretations, expressions. But if, if you just divorce yourself from a supposed personality and a supposed will for a second, and just bring up existers aren't real. And I'm just saying, if you just consider the positive aspect of it, uh, the positive aspect of positive aspect, that's the orienting concept. And I realized that was the final missing piece of the puzzle that answered all the questions and, and took the whole puzzle piece of all the meditation, uh, all the meditations, both philosophy in terms of like, you know, like um, kind of Eastern meditation, that kind of concept. That's what puts it all together. And that's what I've been seeking the entire time like the, the combination of the two, you know, and, and that, that's very interesting to me because like you said, you know, the Western side is maybe more in, intellectual and just, you know, where are the facts? And like you said, the Eastern side throws in the emotions there. And from, from the, the information I've looked at, like you have to have both, you know, there's a bell curve, right? If you're just completely like logical, like no emotions, that's a rational decision making. And then if you're 100% making decisions based on emotions, that's also a rational behavior. So it's like a merging of the two in this like flow of like, where does it need to be for this specific scenario? So having the combination in there. And so, and that, that's where the rational, rational decisions come from as far as people are concerned. Now, if it's about things, you can take out the emotions, right? But, and then I was also thinking about like, where does morality fit in there? Is that with, with Plato's the good? Is that linked in there? Exactly. You're absolutely right, Justin. So that was his chief idea and everything flowed from the good. For example, uh, uh, you already know about the good. Everybody knows about the good. I don't have to teach it to you. When, have you ever come to this scenario? Has anyone ever said, I know it's not ideal, but, and then they give some kind of excuse, like let's say you're sleeping at your friend's house and, but, all the beds are taken and he hears, well, I have an air mattress. I know it's not ideal, but you could use that. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So who taught him that he needed to seek the absolute ideal? Hmm. Society, Why do you I don't have know. the need to apologize to you because he did not seek the absolute ideal? Just inherit, right? Exactly. No one had to teach him to seek the ideal. It's ideal. 
No one had to prove to him that he had to seek the ideal. It's ideal. Why do we seek what's ideal? Because it's ideal. It's self, it's self evident. It's self proving. It's always been there hidden in every single language that can express the concept of positivity. Any adjective that relates to positivity can express it. Every single human language has it. I don't have to prove it. It's already there. That's the orienting factor. So whenever we step away from what's ideal, we know we're doing wrong. We're doing badly, right? The idyllic is the ideal. The ideal is the ideal. Now, you're not always able to get it in human life, of course, but that's not the point. The closer we get to it, the better we are. So the ideal tells us what's positive, what's good. As long as we're in the green and everyone's good and everyone's at some level of idealism going towards that and nobody's hurt, nobody's offended, nobody is crying, nobody is you know, uh, putting a Band-Aid or a, 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 on something bleeding, all the negative stuff that's bad, as long as we're in the green and we haven't touched the black of badness, so to speak, that's the morality. We're all good. Utilitarianism probably comes the closest to capturing that, but it goes wrong when it says that it's still right and okay to do what's good for the majority while we can still hurt the minority. Mm. Plato would say that is a failure of morality. That's rational. Indeed, it's better to serve as many people as we can. If we, and it, it's a lesser of evils choice, but it's still an evil choice because we still have to hurt these people here, right? It would have been better, we would all agree, if we didn't have to hurt anybody. If everybody could have been fine and had their cake and eat it too, if that's possible, it's not always possible, but if that's possible, that's what we should be doing. Why? Because it's ideal. And everybody already knows that. And that's probably my primary philosophical message. If you remember anything from what I've said, anybody out there, that's what I want you to remember. This is what meditation teaches you. This is what meditation harmonizes your soul and your mind to go for, to understand. Uh, this, is, this is the wisdom of what both the East and the West teach. When you take away all the rest, that's it. That's it boiled down into its distilled form. And you can approach the good from, from, a, from a religious perspective, from a monotheistic perspective, from a pantheistic perspective. Every single religion tries to seek the good. They just have different names for it, right? Some people drop the O. Now, do you Other see, like, it's, it's difficult thinking of, like, how, okay, we want everyone to be good and fit into this and the, this decision we're making on this. You know, we want it to work for everybody. But normally that's not reality. You think about th there are some some gray areas there within morality. If you're thinking you know, if, if me stealing from you, Josh, you know, is, is immoral because I'm depriving you of property for my own benefit, mm -hmm. then but what if I'm stealing to provide for my family, to feed my family? You know, where's the, the greater harm? Where's the greater evil? So I'm still depriving you, but now it's OK, quote unquote, mm -hmm. to feed my family rather than just my selfish needs because I want a new pair of sneakers from you, you know? Yeah. Well, if, so if you're starving, why the hell didn't I give you some bread to begin with? Mm. <laughs> what, what kind of person am I? Yeah. Right? Things are not all good if my neighbor is starving to death sure. and I know it. Yeah. Right? Like I could be blissfully ignorant and really ignorant and just be like, everything's great. You know, everyone's fine. <laughs> but as soon as I come across someone bleeding, I'm like, oh, shit, dude, are you okay? You're like, you got to go help them, right? Because yeah. that's not good. <laughs> Somebody's bleeding here. Sure. Well, that's not good. <laughs> this, this, is, this is a definite indication. And also, to answer your question, and this is where it gets a little bit more tricky, and I'm not sure how, how you guys will respond, so I'll say it delicately. Um, there's a difference between the law and the laws we need to instantiate to protect everyone from themselves. Sure. And then what the good, the spirit of the law, or what the good demands. Uh, as long as we remember what the good demands, we can implement pretty much any laws we want. They will be implemented goodly, right? So yeah, we have to make it illegal to steal just because otherwise people will be doing all kind of crazy stuff, probably. Sure. Maybe that's not true, but let's just say it is. But when will we implement this law? You know, when will we prosecute? When will we decide to actually haul them in? When will we mm -hmm. decide to actually charge them? When will we decide to actually go through that process? And that, that discriminator would be, well, what, what, is, what serves the, the good? What serves the good? Uh, is this person uh, a raving psycho lunatic who should be, we have to protect ourselves from this person. They have to be put behind bars and we should be helping them. They should have doctors and they should have medicine and we should have people trying to re rehabilitate them and, and all that, that kind of stuff. So uh, in my one book uh, called The Zombies, I go, and when I say book, I mean a, a Word document I've hammered on until it's big enough to be called a book. 
no <laughs> one will publish this because I'm so, the world is so tribal right now, so far left and so far right. And I'm right in the middle. I seem like I'm the weird guy, right? I seem like I'm the odd man out because <laughs> the left is so angry and the right's so angry and everyone's so angry at each other. And no one's talking or listening to each other, yeah. sadly. Uh, so no one will publish this book. So anyone can have it for free. Just email me, joshbachinsky at gmail.com. I'll give it to you. You can have it. But in this book, I explain how all the laws of a well-functioning liberal democracy, pretty much on the books as they are now, uh, uh, no offense, but probably closer to a Canadian law or Northern European law. Uh, um, uh, again, no offense. <laughs> I'm, I'm Canadian. Hands up. I'm Canadian. Uh, is closer to what I think would be a good instance, instantiation. And again, they're very close to American laws anyway. I mean, it's like little, little niggling details here or there would be different. Like on the concept of free speech, for example, in Canada, we have, uh, in our Charter of Bill and Rights, we also have protected speech. And we can say whatever we want uh, for the same political, philosophical reasons. To, to tell people when something's wrong with the, when, with, with the government and that the government's not allowed to just censor me because I don't like his tie or I don't like his coat or I don't like his skin color. Or I don't like his hair or am I talking about somebody in particular? I don't know, maybe. Hmm. Uh, um, uh, but they have an amendment to that, to that uh, freedom and that it have a hate uh, there's hate crimes. So you're allowed to say whatever you want, but as long as you don't say hateful things for the purpose of just being hateful, as long as you're not, as long as you're not trying to say incendiary mm. things for the, per the, for the express purpose of obviously just being incendiary. Uh, and so you're like, well, you can say whatever facts you want as long as it's not for the purpose of being incendiary or, or hurting someone's feelings or hurting them or begrudging a, 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 you know, a, a, a race, class, or creed. And then you might ask, well, who, who was supposed to decide whether that was incendiary or hurtful? And then our answer is a judge. It does seem subjective as far it, as... Well, it's completely subjective. Of yeah. course it is. That's why we have courts and judges, right? So, so sure. they would get charged with a hate crime and then the judge would decide, was, you know, based on the evidence, was this person just trying to hurt feelings or were they trying to actually inform us of some truth? And that's, that's the de determination and it makes perfect sense in my head. Yeah. Uh, and so that way you can't have anyone just beaking off just to be hateful, like we have people on the left and right now doing. Sure. But if they're trying to actually inform truth, then that truth is protected as, as it should be. At least that's, that's my opinion. That's how we do it up here in Canada. Yeah. It, it's uh, an interesting concept, you know, you know, putting that, that little twist on it and, and making it, you know, subjective and, and, and kind of like what you mentioned, you know, there is discretion, like you said, spirit of the law in certain things like, like, and, when thinking about morality and just depriving people of property, that was just an example. I wasn't mm -hmm. thinking about the law, but yeah, I, I think that, you know, there are certain times, even in my own experience dealing with, you know, prosecutors and everything, it's like, well, what was, what was the intent of this law written for? Right. And, you know, if, if we're not trying to interpret it to make everyone go to jail. It's like, what, like it's, it's, it's worse to steal beer than it is to steal diapers. Right. You know, it's kind of like, it may be the same price, <laughs> but you know, the intention behind it is a little bit different. So it kind of throws in right. some subjectivity there. Yeah. And it's like, do we, do we really want to mess with this? Because they, they were trying to, you know, help out their own, you know, kids rather than just to have a good time type of idea. But no, it's some definitely some interesting concepts there to, to think about, you know, as far as, you know, how, how we intertwine laws and morality and, and all of these different concepts. And that's where, where a lot of people create their values and beliefs. And like you said, people getting stuck on the far left and the far right and going, this is my truth. And you're not allowed to tell me otherwise. <laughs> yeah, that's the dangerous, that's the dangerous part, right? So and I listen, I listen to both sides. I, I hear what the right's saying and I hear what the left is saying. And I can see, because I go slow, I can see <laughs> some of the value of this side and I can see some of the value of that side. Um, but you know, it's, it, anytime someone says, it's my truth, you can't tell me otherwise, that, then we're in very dangerous territory because that yeah. is literally fascist territory. So I would say to that, because that's so prevalent nowadays, how do you have a conversation with someone like that, regardless of, where they're they're coming from on the back end like how do you how do you broach that like with the with the concepts of just having that type of conversation within the morality or well here's the thing that's going to blow your guys mind it's very as you all know it's very hard to do when someone's super emotional uh it's it's like they're drunk it's almost impossible to talk reason to them 
And, you know, we could discuss uh, the nonviolent conflict resolution all day techniques, and we can discuss psychologically how you would, you would change that perspective. If that's what you guys want to talk about, we can talk about that. But would you guys be interested to know how we got to this scenario? Because it's a very interesting story that virtually nobody knows. Sure. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. There, we are literally in this scenario because the last greatest philosopher wanted us to be in this, in this scenario. Hmm. He knew very well that once you get the left and the right so angry that they can't see the forest for the trees anymore and they will not talk together, that society, that, that society however big or small, will invariably self-destruct. Invariably. Right? Think of a work group. There's four people in the work group. You all disagree as to what's true. The wrench is on the table. There is no table. I hate you all. I'm going to blow you up. There's no way that work group is going to work together. They don't have no common truths, mm -hmm. right? Frederick Nietzsche, the last greatest philosopher, anybody listening can look it up. Everything I'm about to say, however mind-blowingly incredible. What era are we talking? 19th, 19th century. He published from 1850 right up until the 1900s, just when the Nazi movement was starting to pick up steam. And uh, he's associated with the Nazis. I think it's unfortunate. I think it was his sister that actually took his writings and Nazi-ified it. Although they were pretty close to Nazi anyway. So I mean, it's like, yeah, you know, was he or not? He wasn't a card-carrying member, but he was pretty damn close anyway. It didn't take a lot of work to pull his philosophy over into that direction. But he said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm not that far off from what he said. I hate liberal democracy. It's disgusting. It's weak. It's braying and empathic and, and whining on the left side, and it's braggadocious and pig-headed and, and, and just disgusting on the right side. Uh, I hate them with all my heart and all of their, their loving, their rights-based freedom bullcrap. So I'm going to destroy them. And so what he did is he popped, literally, this, this was his plan. Uh, he fully admits it. And so what he did, you know how he's, how, now, do you know how he's actually destroying us right now? He developed the concept of culture, lifestyle, and subjective truths. Mm. Those three, and made those, truths, made those truths popular and divided us into the cool kids and the, the, the dumb kids, or he called the strong and the weak. And he said, the strong artists don't believe in life, they don't believe in truth. They have cultures, they have lifestyles. They, they believe in their own truth they can make. It's only the weak who believe in real truths because they need to appeal to something greater than them to make themselves feel better. And so that single-handed move got filtered through his philosophy into the Nazis, and that's what fueled the Nazis in saying, we're strong, we deserve to kill everybody else because we're the strongest. That directly comes from Nietzsche, filtered into Heidegger as well. And also the left, far left po uh, French postmodernists took those ideas, Derrida, Sartre, Foucault, uh, Jean-Francois Leotard, and they took those ideas and they, they filtered into academia, which filtered into business, and now is filtered into common life. Tell me if these ideas sound familiar. There are no truths. All truths are subjective, most especially about the moral truth. There's no such thing as the moral truth. All those truths are subjective. There are no truths. All we have are alternate facts. All we have are post-truths. That's, and that's being now said from Nietzsche through academia, all the way through business, who's been using this through Edward Bernays, if you guys have ever watched the documentary, The Century of the Self. Edward Bernays, who was literally Sigmund Freud's nephew, hmm. and Sigmund Freud took all his philosophy from, from Nietzsche. So we have Nietzsche, Freud, Bernays, who around the early 1900s developed the word called propaganda, which is the war before the war. They gave it to all the popular uh, governments, US and Russia and uh, Germany, who started using propaganda against each other all over the place, which is just false information to control the narrative, to control truth, to confuse truth, to obfuscate truth, but to make the left and the right fight even more. Mm -hmm. And then that got sold to capital, that got sold to capitalism, to corporations. And so corporations, we used to be a needs-based culture and we only bought what we needed in a free capitalistic society. Bernays single-handedly changed us into a wants-based culture that suddenly needs to shave our armpits and suddenly needs to shave our legs and we suddenly need to you know, get fabric softener and we suddenly need to buy this and buy that to inflame our desires using uh, uh, Nietzsche and Freud psychology uh, and uh, psychological and post-hypnotic suggestion 
to inflame our desires to buy more and more and more so that the rich can make more money. Uh, and then uh, to get the left and the right fighting because no longer can we, agree, we can't agree on moral truths. We can't even agree on basic facts. One side denies facts, this side denies facts or picks the facts they like. This side denies facts or picks the facts they like. We can't even talk to each other anymore. That was single-handedly the, uh, the, the, the distinct purpose of Friedrich Nietzsche to destroy us because he hated us. And it's working. He predicted it would take 200 years. He's 30 years off course. And by the time climate change is done with us in 30 years, the sun has just gone into a 30 year low. And so it's actually pumping out less uh, energy right now. Everybody listening can look this up. I haven't said a single lie the whole time. The sun has gone to a 30 year low. When it kicks back on to its full power, climate change will kick on full power. We're gonna see uh, degree centigrade increases and the world is gonna be radically different than what it looks like now. We'll be lucky if, if major countries remain the same, quite frankly. Mm. Uh, the, I want to transition a little bit to your TEDx about Google because it kind of it, it kind of comes together here a little bit. We talk about needing uh, a little bit more regulation or a lot more regulation on Google because it seems like Google just kind of controls everything. What do you think that we need to do as a society to put in checks and balances so that there's more uh, there's more voices in in the field of uh, search engine other than Google? Well, see, that's the problem. And there's no way you can control Google for a number of reasons. One, all the people in office don't understand Google or how it works. Uh, the, tr traditionally, people who get into uh, politics are traditionally older. They skew older. And uh, it's just a simple fact that older people just don't understand technology. Uh, when they had Mark Zuckerberg on the carpet in Senate, they're literally asking him basic IT questions like, how do I get my Facebook up on my phone and stuff like that? Like they, they, they do not understand. They can't understand. And you cannot regulate what you don't understand. So they don't understand the racket, they don't understand the game. Uh, uh, Google is just an example of the capitalistic, uh, unre unrepentant capitalism, unrestricted capitalism that, uh, uh, I, I don't have a problem with capitalism per se, I have a problem with unrepentant capitalism or unrestricted capitalism, where the rich companies can just gobble up each other and become larger monopolies as Google has. And they, they operate uh, without paying any taxes or as little taxes as possible. Uh, and they operate completely free of any regulation. And so there's absolutely no way to stop Google. Uh, my, my, TED talk, my TEDx talk was a great talk of another way that it should be done. The, the global internet search utility should be a not-for-profit utility that's controlled by both left and right-wing parties so that the, the truth cannot be skewed to the left or to the right. Right now, it is completely and utterly controlled by a private, for-profit Silicon Valley with Silicon Valley values company. And no matter how they pay lip service to, uh, uh, and I've gotten, you can check my, 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 um, my blog, I've, I've gotten into debates with their senior engineer, uh, Paul Haar is their senior engineer. I've gotten into debates with him. He's like, how could us following science not be the right thing to do? And I'm like, for these reasons, one, we didn't vote for you. I have no control over you. I have no say over what the search rights are. You can defund any company you want like that. All you have to do is just take their search engine traffic away and they're dead, they're gone. You get to be the better business bureau. You get to, uh, and you get to control all the information flow, both the information flow going in and the information flow going out. Google and Facebook are, this, are the two largest problems we have right now because that's where we consume the vast, vast majority of our, of our content, right? And they are working under the Bernaysian plan completely. They're, they're, they don't give a crap about morality or ethics. They say they do because every company is supposed to appear congenial. But in, in, in the background, they don't care. All they care about is their shareholders and making money. So whatever's going to make the most money and confrontation makes money. Fighting between the left and right makes money. It makes us more rational to buy more stuff, just like we talked about earlier. And it makes us more rational to share more stuff and to participate in the social media platform more and to search Google more for stuff. So yeah, they try to tailor us a little bit towards their left or their right, whichever way they're going. That's why China made TikTok. TikTok, China's brilliant. Ch China saw what we're doing. Okay, we can do that. And they made TikTok. I didn't know so now, China made TikTok. That's crazy. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, it was yes. a different app before. and they, It had a different name. And then they, they pushed it back out. 
yeah, they know that data is now the, the, the most expensive commodity on the planet. It used to be oil. The age of oil is dead. And as we saw in COVID, in the COVID crisis, they were giving barrels of oil away. That was the first time in centuries that oil had become a negative value. The, 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 the price of a barrel of oil was, we'll give it to you plus $20. Mm. That was the price of oil, right? The, the, the age of oil is dead, as it should be, because it's caused... See, that's going to be a, a nice forest. In 30 years, that's what forests are going to look like in, in mm. North America in some places. That's, that's a conservative estimate. I'm not, I'm not a crazy liberal who's saying, oh, the world's going to explode. That's a conservative estimate, guys. Uh, at least that's the risk. And how, and, and how long of a time period do you think? I, I, I've been watching climate change since, you can read my book, The Zombies, you'll see, at least textually, I said in there that it gives some proof what I'm about to say. I've been watching it since early 2000s, when just the crazy crank scientists were saying, hey, we're seeing this huge spike in CO2. Um, this can't be good. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> anyone else watching this, right? And then uh, I predicted before Bush even got into office that uh, that this is the way things are going to go, and it's been it's been happening faster than anyone's even predicted. Uh, it, it's going to go. So it, no one knows for sure. I think in 30, 20 to thirty years, they say fifty to eighty. I think it's more like twenty to thirty. We're going to see some. I mean, we already see the effects. We already see water levels raising. We already see hurricanes season increasing. We see tornado season increasing, we see wildfire season increasing. That's what it does. Just little, little, little bits. It makes natural disasters so that you can't live in these areas safely anymore. You can't live in the tornado belt anymore when there's like, instead of one class five tornado a season, there's like a hundred class five tornadoes. Or you can't live in Florida or those areas or New Orleans anymore around sea level because it doesn't matter if the sea level only rises six inches or a foot, it's gonna poison the water table. Sewage is going to back up. It's going to poison all your water table. And so you can't live there anymore. You can't get fresh water anymore, right? So the systems are incredibly weak. Our systems are incredibly, as, as COVID proved, as, as COVID showed, our systems, are, 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 our supply chains, our systems for, for dealing with everything are incredibly paper thin. And, and, and humans are very really smart and we're really quick, but we can't deal with that many problems simultaneously. And so yeah, some rich people are going to be fine, like it never happened. Everyone presumes that they're, they're in that group, right? Everyone presumes I'm in the neighborhood that's going to be fine, of course. Hmm. Statistically, no. That's going to, the, the, the problems of the third and the second world, which already exist in both Canada and, and the United States, those bubbles of third world problems are going to get bigger if you're looking at a map top down. And suddenly the whole middle of the country is a third world country now with third world country services and problems and, and pestilence and lawlessness and all those kinds of problems, right? Well, in your opinion, what do we need to change to slow this down? We need to seek the good. We need to meditate. The only way, I, I'm dead serious. The only thing that solves this problem, because the main problem is the left and the right won't talk to each other because Nietzsche inflamed us, because he took away the concept of truth and so we have nothing to, we have nothing to come together on. There's no truth anymore. It's just the four horsemen of the apocalypse at this point really is all there is. <laughs> we have to get back to reminding us that there's a truth and there's something that we can work towards. It's the good. And we need to do meditation both in the Western sense and the Eastern sense. The only thing that solves this, this, this problem is education. But here's the problem with education. It takes 20 or 30 years to educate a generation. Right now we have generations that are so angry on the left and so angry on the right that they're burning down Burger Kings. Now, I'm not going to talk to whether they should be or not. I'm not going to talk to, you know, whether that should happen or not. I'm not even going to touch those issues because, quite frankly, who, who, who am I to, to talk on those issues, right? I'm up in Canada. I'm white. I'm heterosexual. Who am I to even give an opinion on it? But, but I know this is bad. <laughs> That's the one opinion I will give. I know, this is not this, I know this is not the sign of a healthy democracy, okay? This is not the sign of a well-run, peaceful uh, country, no matter how that came to, to happen, right? The, the, the only way to solve every human problem is education. Education so it doesn't turn out that way anymore. Education that there is, people have to calm down at the first part. I don't know how that happens. Maybe a new figurehead gets voted in that doesn't piss so many people off. But I mean, even if Biden gets voted in, let's say I go that way, hypothetically, the right is still going to be quite angry, right? Because they've already been, they're, they're a hornet, hornet nest here, hornet nest here. Voting in a different guy that offends this side, or you vote in this, this guy that offends this side. 
Do you see what I mean? Like one side's still going to be super pissed off. And so maybe if we get one side to calm down and instead of both sides being hornet nests, maybe then there'll be enough common sense and common will that we can talk together. But um, my project is to, uh, quite frankly, secretly and surreptitiously insert the good into the conversation. Uh, that's why I have uh, my show. I have uh, a Bach meditation. It's bit.ly slash Bach meditation. I have comic versus philosopher, which is a podcast that I'm on. And I'm trying to secretly get little bits of philosophy into people without them realizing it because nobody wants to hear the stuff I just said, right? Uh, that's really depressing. I didn't even, you know, really get into it. So uh, but it's thought provoking stuff though, you know, in, and that's what it's about. Like you need to be able to, to think about these different issues and, and, and hear other people's perspective. So, so what's, what's some advice you'd give to people to, to be open to hearing other people's opinions. Like, cause that, cause like you said, that seems like that's the path we need to go. We need to be able to communicate and educate each other. How do we, how do we get there? Well, there's a couple of tricks that use in sales psychology and there's a couple of tricks they use in hypnotism uh, that could work. So literally on the ground level, if you're literally having a conversation with someone, and I, I'm probably telling you guys stuff you already know. One, use their name. To empathize, empathize with them. My name is Josh. I have a kid too. You know, if it's safe, show a picture. Common ground, common ground, common ground. Make common ground. Then you say, "Well, you're free to disagree if you want." Or uh, it's uh, this is reverse child psychology. You're free to disagree if you want. Or you know, okay, well, it's just my opinion. You know, my two cents. But don't you think everyone's really angry? Everyone's too angry right now. Don't don't you think? Don't you agree? And you give them the chance to disagree and then immediately they're going to be, well, I don't want to disagree. I'll agree with you. That's reverse child, child psychology, right? Uh -huh. And neuroscience has shown that it works. Neuroscience has shown that it has proven that statistically that'll work. Not every time, but statistically sure. that'll make them more favorable to your point of view. And then, you know, avoid all the hot button topics. <laughs> don't, don't say the wrong words, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, and, and, uh, and everyone knows, I mean, everyone knows that when people get too emotional, you make bad decisions. Everybody knows that. Uh, and so, so just be like, don't you think we're all too angry right now to make a, you know, a, a good rational decision? Wouldn't it be better if we could get together and work together? Because, and that, that's gonna work with a certain percentage of the population, but as you well know, both in the American Senate and around the world, quite frankly, it's, it's a world problem. It's not an American problem, it's a world problem. There are people who have gotten so upset that they've defined themselves as this or that. Mm. And now you're, now you're dealing with their ego. Yeah. And there's no more powerful force on the planet than a human being's ego, right? They will fight tooth and nail to protect the homeostasis of that ego mm -hmm. until the day they die. So the trick is not getting past that tripping point where now I define myself as a, you know, on the left, a social justice warrior, or now I define myself on the left, a crazy conspiracy, on the right, a crazy conspiracy theorist. And now they've, now they've got personal stake and their ego is involved. And that's really hard to do. Like, like you need to get to cult level status to break down people's egos. That's what cults do, yeah. right? They break down your ego and they reform it into the ego they want. And that is intensive. Like Scientology, you got to get them in there. You got to brainwash them for days. You know, it's a lot of work, <laughs> right? So it's hard to do. It's like navigating a minefield. It's, it, it's really tough to, 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 really have those tough conversations with people when there's so many, like you said, those beliefs and values really tie in there. So yes. Josh, lo yeah. lots of interesting stuff, man, like super interesting information. We could probably talk to you like for a few hours on, on everything that you're bringing up. Um, I know you mentioned it a little bit, but like how else can um, our, our viewers and our listeners like check you out, like find your content? Well, what's the best way to, to find you? Sure. So if you want more of kind of philosophy, but you like a more comedic perspective, uh, look for Comic versus Philosopher. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Buzzsprout. I can give you guys some links as well. Perfect. Uh, and I think it's posted in a couple other places. I'm not even sure. It, it should be everywhere. It should be Spotify, but, but I have an employee doing it, and, and I don't know what he's doing. He's off in the race. He's playing Fortnite, I think. Um, uh, and there's also, I, uh, I have a YouTube show, uh, Bach meditation is at bit.ly slash Bach meditation, B I T dot L Y slash B A C H meditation, all lowercase. And that's more of the self-help. That's more of the meditation aspect. 
because as I mentioned, you know, with the abuse as a child, I developed anxiety disorder, uh, clinical anxiety disorder. I developed uh, clinical depression. And although I am not recommending anybody out there stop their medication, I'm not recommending that. And I'm not recommending anyone out there stop their therapy. However, I have found that meditation for myself, I've been able to completely control my anxiety disorder, which was quite strong. It was, it was clinical strength and my depression just through meditation simply. I'm not on any, I'm not uh, doing, taking any therapy right now, and I'm not uh, on any medication for it right now. So uh, I'm not saying it's a cure-all and that I can cure sure. all your wounds or, or, or heal you, but I think it can help people. Uh, and so if you're more interested, but and there's a lot of philosophy in there too. It's, it's everything I was talking about but from a more meditative kind of perspective. So if you're interested in that, please check out my channel. I also have a free meditation app. You're, 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 uh, you're free to use it. It's at app.meditationassistant.com. And it uses every single trick I've found in psychology and neuroscience and in the ancient uh, 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 Eastern meditation, Buddhist techniques that nobody has heard of that are incredibly powerful, that I was, I was super lucky. I just, I just happened, stumbled across. I found the right teachers who taught me these ancient secrets that are thousands of years old. I was like, blew my mind. I've taken all that through my PhD and everything, and I wrapped it all up into the meditation assistant. And so you'll see that on the show, and you'll see that in the meditation assistant as well. It's quite profound. I think it can help people out. Well, I'm going to make sure to check it out myself, but we're going to make sure to put it all down in, this, in the show comments so, so everybody can get a, get a hold of it. And, and Josh, we'd like to wrap up the show with the, the, the title of our show in mind, Actions and Limits. What would you say is the number one action that people can implement right now to really make a difference in their lives? And also with these limiting beliefs that we place on ourselves, what would be that number one limit that we need to remove to make a big difference in our lives? Well, it's going to sound pretty self-serving, but because I made it into a meditation tool to be as effective as possible, my meditation tool, I mean, it's free. I'm not making any money off of this. So this is not a whole giant sales pitch, right? It's totally free for everyone to use. Uh, and um, it, it uses every single trick in the book I've found to psychologically get you into a better space. If you're angry, it'll calm you down. If you're, if you're anxious, it'll bring you down. If you're depressed, it'll bring you up. Um, the problem right now with meditation is we have a very kind of white person debased understanding of it that we pulled through little bits we liked and we think meditation is just sitting in a dark room with your eyes closed. Hmm. That is one meditative technique out of like a hundred. Sure. That's not going to do anything, right? Like sure, it'll calm you down. Like it's how we go to sleep, <laughs> but it's not going to do anything, right? There's so much more to discover there for both the Western meditation and Eastern meditation. So if, you're, if you don't want to try the app, check out my show first. Maybe you'll get to know me, you know, that kind of a thing. That's the greatest action and the greatest limit. Um, get off social media. <laughs> get off. Get off the. Don't don't yell yell at the TV if you want, like I do. But but don't go into Twitter and give your opinion. Social media has gamified vice. They've gamified gossiping in the most negative, churlish way. They've gamified vitriol. Don't 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 be their 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 puppet. Don't be their little 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 tool. Turn off the social media, go for a walk, calm down, connect with people in real life. Uh, don't believe everything you hear on social media. Check the facts out. Give it a few days before you say anything or believe anything. Ruminate about it. Think about it. Uh, and, and everybody just, just take it down a notch, right? Calm down. Uh, if you're not going to do the meditation, which is going to do all that for you automatically without you even realizing, sure. that would be my other suggestion. I like it. I think that's a really good suggestion there to, to limit the, the intake that we do on that. I, I've, I've been doing that lately myself as well. So Josh, again, thank you for coming on the show. You're such a great guest. And I think we learned a lot ourselves and, and hopefully our viewers and our listeners really picked up some stuff and, um, and we'll be checking out your content as well. So Josh, thank you for coming on the show, man. My pleasure, guys. I'll come back anytime. Good. Oh, what a great guest. Uh, Josh was a wealth of information. I know we, we touched on several different topics there. Um, what, what, what was your favorite topic that, that Josh brought up? That's hard to pin down because he went all over the gamut. Uh, just, you know, just his, uh, his level of knowledge. I mean, I thought the guy should be a, a college professor. 
Sure. You know, he's at that level. I know he has a PhD, but I'm thinking, why is he not uh, teaching classes? I mean, obviously he likes to talk about this topic sure. and, um, I'm, you know, well, I, you know, we ran out of time, but that was something I wanted to kind of ask him, but, uh, maybe we'll bring him on again and again, because he definitely has more stuff to tell us. So, yeah. I mean, obviously he could be a philosophy professor, you know, and I, yeah. I could sit and listen to that for, you know, a couple mm-hmm. hours a week and, you know, eat that up. You know, that's, that's super interesting to me. Um, and I know he, he touched on, it, it was very interesting, the spectrum of stuff that he talked about, because going into to Google and the SEO and talking about how, you know, the restriction for the, those bigger businesses and then, but it all seemed to tie back into to like that idea of the greater good and, you know, what is going to benefit society the most and how do we, how do we walk that line? How do we keep that balance? So it was, I thought it was very interesting that it did keep tying back into to that aspect. So one other, one other point that was interesting to me was, you know, I asked him about, you know, global warming and what can we do to mm-hmm. prevent it? And he says meditation that I, that I was like, I, I did not think that's where he was going to go with that, but it was, yeah, but, but what did it come back to, right? We, we have to be able to have a conversation. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. But yeah, I, that was it, right off the bat. Like, right, it was like, oh, that's out of left field, right? Mm-hmm. How, we're going to meditate, you know, global warming better. But coming back to what's the greater good? Like, how do we have these conversations with each other from our, our, the far sides of our political spectrum? And, and just getting back to, hey, let, let's figure out what's going to be, you know, best for everyone and how do we how do we accomplish that it, it's definitely not an easy task um I, I think it's something that you know it it's it's not going to happen overnight it's going to be something that we have to figure out but um yeah so a great show paul so uh, let, let's wrap it up with another segment of ask paul anything i had a I had a, a fun question come in for you paul this is from uh jessica in nevada it says paul what is the silliest thing you've heard people say about you? The silliest thing that people say about me, uh, gosh, okay, that's you know probably a lot of probably things that they they got that I do silly. <laughs> I would say that they they think that it's really odd and silly that I have this parking phobia. They think that is just weird. Like what? I mean, just. You know the supermarket that it's right there can we just park a little bit closer why do we have to walk so so far there's no other people there but yet you've got to park so far away and, and that's just my nature I, I i i don't like to park next to, to people and i like to prevent myself from parking next to people i don't want any door dings it's not that i have that great of a car i just that's just something i always think about is door dings and such so I've never thought of it as a phobia because I've been subject to your uh, parking <laughs> abilities and how far away you do park my, miles and miles away in my perspective. <laughs> as far as, but uh, <laughs> your parking phobia. I, I like that. Well, that is a, uh, yeah, that's definitely a, a fun one. And, you know, I, <laughs> I've been, I've been, uh, I've been there. So I, I know what they're talking about, but Jessica, thank you for the question. Uh, we always like, you know, fun questions uh, to wrap up the show or something that it makes us think. So everyone, make sure you continue to send in your questions to actionsandlimits at gmail.com and your questions may be featured on the show. So great guest, Paul, and another great show. Uh, like you said, maybe we'll have to have Josh back on because we probably could have talked to him for um, a couple more hours um, listening to him chat about those different topics. So really great show, Paul. Absolutely. For Justin Atherton, this is Paul Fortune. We'll see you next week. All right. See you next Monday. Thank you for listening to the show. Don't miss an episode. Click and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on your favorite podcast platform and find us on Instagram and Facebook under Actions and Limits to stay updated on all our upcoming content. Continue to email the show at actionsandlimits at gmail.com for our segment Ask Paul Anything. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week.